Today's episode of the Riderflex podcast is sponsored by our friends at Rockies Venture Club, an angel investing group dedicated to accelerating economic development by educating and connecting investors and entrepreneurs. Their mission is to advance economic development in the Rocky Mountain region. On today's episode of the Riderflex podcast, we have guest Jim Franklin, an entrepreneur, investor, board member, C-level executive, and currently an instructor at CU. Right. People think it's like, you know, oh, became a CEO. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Isn't that so true? It's even that's the same for famous people, right? You, you, so they hear, you see a popular person all of a sudden on the radio or a, an actor or somebody that's suddenly like super popular and everybody thinks, oh, that happened overnight. No, it didn't. <laughs> Not most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Franklin on the Rider Flex podcast. How are you doing today, Jim? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Awesome story. I got to hear you speak at one of the RVC events. Um, so love your history. Love your story. By the way, congrats on an awesome career and all the things that you've done. Pretty phenomenal. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. And met a lot of great people on the way. Now, when you uh, packed your stuff up and drove out to Colorado, what, what were you driving? Were you driving like a, a, a van? Or I, I was trying to visualize what, what kind of vehicle was it? I was trying to visualize that because I listened to an earlier podcast. Do you know what an FJ40 is? Uh, no, I don't. I'm sorry. It's I don't know a Land Cruiser. It looks like a Jeep Wrangler. Okay. Uh, it's kind of that forest green, you know, 1973. FJ40, Sweet. straight six cylinder, top speed about 55 miles an hour, <laughs> no storage. Uh, yeah, so I had uh, yeah, very few things with me. I had my triathlon bike, a little laptop, uh, a business suit for doing some interviews, and I had a friend from high school that had moved out here that I uh, could stay with her for a few weeks while I figured out you know, some kind of housing situation. Love it. And it took, it took a number of days and just kind of camped along the way and tried to stay off interstate since my vehicle wasn't really interstate worthy. Now, where were you coming from? Virginia at the time? Yep. Went to school at uh, the College of William Mary. I did accounting undergrad. Uh, no particular reason other than it's a very uh, top national program at the school. So why do we climb big mountains? You know, they're there. And the accounting program, William Mary, is known to be tough. So I thought, that sounds fun. Well, uh, I stayed on at William Mary to do the uh, JD MBA. So a uh, law degree, went to law school for a year, realized I didn't like it. So I cross applied to the MBA program, loved it. So I learned about venture capital, uh, but you should finish what you start. So I finished law school, you know, okay. while doing the MBA in a combined program. Uh, and so after eight years of Williamsburg, I was ready for a change of scenery. <laughs> I had to head west to Boulder and pursue triathlons as an amateur and figure out a career. Well, had you been to Colorado before that? I had been a couple of times. Okay. Uh, once as a kid and uh, to kind of uh, been to Boulder and Colorado Springs and Pikes Peak and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, and then once in college, uh, came out for a national fraternity conference in Fort Collins. Uh, and, well, Holly Coors is a, a friend of mine from William Mary. And she picked us up at the airport and we stayed in Golden and she took us out for a, a memorable night in Boulder. And I thought, <laughs> man, it's a good place to live. And then in Fort Collins, we had a, a memorable evening up at Horse Tooth Reservoir. <laughs> this place is awesome. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, you're thinking, hmm, now I, I might want to live here. <laughs> gotcha. Midsummer, and it was just pleasant. You know, it wasn't hazy, hot, and humid, and people were all friendly. And I thought it was just cool to see a, a thunderstorm on the mountains or on the plains while you're looking at snow fields on the mountains, and you're you know, waist deep in a reservoir, and you're just like, this is, this is okay. So you were a big time athlete in high school and did you play some intramurals in college and stuff like that or, or yeah, talk to me? A big time athlete. I was a tennis player and runner. Uh, we had a competitive okay. cross country program okay. in the town I grew up with, uh, but I did not uh, compete in college. I uh, decided to do uh, the joint fraternity and had a good fun four years uh, <laughs> while getting that accounting degree. Um, but then uh, it was in graduate school is when I realized that after four years of you know, drinking beer and eating poorly, <laughs> Uh, maybe that's not a good life choice. So I kept drinking some beer, but you know, started running uh, again, like I had in high school. So I've really been uh, training since 1990, uh, uh, doing triathlons through the 90s and 
uh, 20 seasons. Wow. Um, Very so cool. Got, Are you um, here's the entrepreneurial angle is, uh, you know, sort of being poor in the nineties, it costs about 10 grand to try and qualify for Ironman Hawaii. You, you, you travel and you got to go and do a lot of stuff. I and I thought that. I wanted to do an Ironman. So, uh, for about a hundred bucks, I could just do one in Boulder. So I made up my own course. I call it RYO, so for roll your own. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> to do a gift certificate to a friend opened the South Boulder Rec Center early. So I swam before it opened and I rode a bike to Fort Collins back to Boulder Reservoir and run a lap around the reservoir out to Lions and back. And that's a marathon. Uh, <laughs> finished with the uh, pizza at Old Chicago's down on Pearl Street, right? <laughs> Go to bed. <laughs> Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Well, that's pretty cool. Where'd you grow up though? Before uh, you went to school, uh, did you grow up in the Midwest or where? Yeah, I was born in Iowa City, the University of Iowa. So I guess a Hawkeye by birth, uh, but I only stayed there for a few years. Uh, my dad had gotten a master's in healthcare administration uh, and followed his career to Pennsylvania. I see. Uh, he became a hospital CEO uh, and we grew up in Pittsburgh uh, and then Chambersburg, uh, which is a small town in South Central PA. Uh, mm -hmm. just north of the Maryland uh, border there. Good, good place to grow up, but I wanted to, I wanted to see the world. So my parents okay. got us out traveling around the U.S. a lot, which was awesome to see. We have family all over. Uh, and then with the business things, I've been able to really see the world, which has been uh, exciting. Did you have siblings? Uh, yeah, I have an older brother, just a year ahead of me. Uh, and so I have been very fortunate that my parents were high school sweethearts and uh, still are healthy and get along very well. So I came from a very functional family rather than wow. a dysfunctional family. And uh, my brother and I uh, got along. We had very separate interests. Uh, he was a ham radio operator and learned Morse code when he was, you know, 12 and uh, cool. you could fix anything. So I grew up in a household where everything just always worked. Uh, so that made me uh, very <laughs> slow to learn how to fix things because uh, everything in his world is sort of optimized. In my world, things don't always get get fixed. We have to hire someone to come in and make all your stuff work. So where'd the, uh, where, where'd the entrepreneurial bug come from? Cause your dad was a kind of a lifelong executive. Where, where'd that entrepreneurial bug, how'd that happen? I think it was in, uh, William Mary in that MBA program. I realized something myself is I probably, the main driver for me is to move away from boredom, right? So if something seems boring, I move away from it. And so having an accounting degree, guess what? I didn't want to be an accountant. Uh, because it's very predictable what your career looks like. If you join a firm in DC or Atlanta, like many of my fellow graduates did, it's a good career, but it just wasn't for me because you could tell what you're going to do. Same thing going to law school, right? When you're in law school, everyone gets excited about joining a big law firm and doing litigation or whatever it is. And it's just like, you know, you know, seven years from now, if things go well, you'll be a junior partner. And if you, you know, go further, uh, you'll be a senior partner. But you can tell 30 years in advance, you know, what country club you belong to, how many kids you'll have, who you'll marry, what their names will be, the car you drive. And uh, that's when I realized that I like chaos and uncertainty. Uh, and so when I learned about venture capital and the business program, I'm like, oh, this seems, I like business. I'm, I'm good at math, but I'm not like a mathematician. I like business math. And so uh, I'm sort of a quantitatively oriented person and I like business and I like chaos and I wanted to do triathlons and all those things lined up at, you know, at Boulder. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. And then an awesome career, which includes, uh, by the way, being uh, the CEO at SynGrid, worked at, worked at Oracle even before that. Um, an awesome career all the way through. Uh, let me ask you, when you did, did, did SynGrid or did somebody, when you were at Oracle, how did you get over to SynGrid? Was that a was there, was there a connection? Was there a network? Did they recruit you? How'd that switch happen? Or, or, did, or did Oracle purchase SynGrid? I don't know how that happened. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I was at Oracle through an acquisition. Okay. So that's sort of another story we want to talk about. But the, the Oracle part is after being at Oracle three and a half years, uh, I walked away. Uh, and so we made quite a bit of money when we sold the company and it ended up at Oracle. And then at Oracle, they pay you an insane amount of money to be an executive there. Uh, and after three and a half years, it just wasn't a good trade anymore. I wanted my time and flexibility. Uh, and I've always done a lot around the Boulder and Denver startup community. And I thought, I don't know what I'll do next, but, you know, I've got some hang time, you know, three to five years. Kids are young, you know, just life is good. I'm healthy. Uh, let's you know, just take advantage of some of this time while I had it. And so I left Oracle September 2nd, 2010. Uh, it's after the annual bonus checks clear. And <laughs> uh 
And so everyone's like, let's have coffee, you know? And I'm like, uh, you know, so I ended up having a ton of coffees in September and into October. Uh, and everyone's like, what are you gonna do? And I said, I don't know, you retired. I'm like, I don't feel retired. And uh, I've known Brad Feld a long time and he was one of the people I had coffee with. And he says, no, no, you're on sabbatical. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, yeah, sabbatical. Sabbatical, right? <laughs> And Brad said, well, you know, once you take a break, because I've been doing this math thing for about 10 years, a math software company. I was, I was the crystal ball guy before I was the Sengrid guy. And he said, you know, when you, know, when you get, you know, maybe take a year and just do something else and unplug and then come back and uh, we'll do something fun together, you know, when, when you want to get back involved in something. So I'm like, great, thanks a lot, sabbatical. So I had, you know, coffees again, I'd say sabbatical. It was like, okay. Uh, and then in October, uh, later October, Brad calls and said, you know, forget what I told you. Have I got a deal for you? <laughs> of course. Yeah. A year ago, uh, nice founders and they got great traction. They're like five blocks from my house and they hadn't spent a nickel of the five million uh, because there's founders who uh, run three companies before, but all self-funded. Okay. And so if you're used to being self-funded, you don't know what to do with $5 million in the bank. You just kind of keep, you know, snorkeling along with the cash flow. Um, which was fine. The business was growing very well. Uh, but then Amazon came in with a competing product and it was time to put that money to work and jujitsu Amazon and, and go create a business. And so I told Brad, I'm like, I just left Oracle. And you know, after being at Oracle for three and a half years on the quarterly you know, grind, uh, even as a general manager of a business unit, it's like I was ready for a breather. And, and, so and you had exited even before that, right? You had already been a CEO and exited from another company or had a couple of exits yeah. even before that, right? Well, no. Yeah, it was sort of the same exit that happened sort of multiple times. Okay. Sort of funny story. So it was Decisioneering was a company here in Boulder, the makers of Cristobal Software, love the business. Uh, we sold it to Hyperion, uh, which was, did a you know, big public company uh, doing accounting software. Uh, and we sold it to Hyperion on February 1st of 07. Mm -hmm. and the reason I remember the date was on March 1st, so 29 days later, Hyperion sold to Oracle. Ah, but we didn't know yeah. Hyperion was selling to Oracle. So <laughs> we got a cash deal from Hyperion on February 1st. That's good. Hired as a Hyperion executives for 29 days before we got rolled into being Oracle executives. I, I see. Yeah, so we got a second bite at the Apple when Hyperion sold, and then a third bite when Oracle hired us as executives. And we got new equity and uh, uh, RSUs and all that stuff. So I, it was it was a very interesting year in 07. But by July of 07, we were full-time Oracle employees running a global business unit uh, called the Crystal Ball Global Business Unit. And I was the vice president of enterprise performance management, which is the Hyperion business. And I'd only been in Hyperion for a month. Uh, but the Hyperion management team had been taken out in the acquisition, which kind of left me there uh, running the business part of it. There's the engineering part, but not the, the, the business part. Uh, so I got to work for Charles Phillips, who was the co-president with Safra Katz at Oracle at the time, mm -hmm. who owned all of you know, sales globally uh, and everything customer facing. He had a you know, $25 billion number. Uh, and yeah, it was a very a brief time that I worked from directly. Uh, but then I had a uh, John Kopke, who was a great uh, mentor and friend, who was the CTO at Hyperion. Uh, and so then I worked for John and he was a good coach to me. It's like, I'd never worked at a giant company before. I mean, mm, Oracle right. went from like 30-ish thousand people to 80,000 people while I was there with the Sun acquisition and other things. And I didn't know how to be effective inside of a big company. So John mm. was a good mentor and coach for you. He just said, tell me what you want to get done and I'll help you navigate, you know, how the politics of how you get something like that done. Uh, at but, at, but, but at some point you came home and told your wife, I'm done. I'm going to take some time off. I quit. And uh, you're just about to relax. You're trying to figure out what's, what, what sabbatical even means. And you're having coffee with your friends. And Brad's like, uh, never mind. I think you should meet these founders because I think you should be the CEO. And you're like, ah, wait a minute. I was going to take a little vacation. <laughs> yeah. So I basically said, like, not yet, right? I, said, I actually started training for the Ledbo 100. It's a 100 huh? mile trail run. Okay. And um, I started training that fall. And it would have been the, the following August. So it was, you know, 11 months in advance, you train for something like that. And things you do when you get older, right? And so, uh, uh, and so I, 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 sorry, I, was, I really slow played Sangrid. I'm like, you know, I'm not ready. And so like in November, I met one board member. In December, okay. I met another board member. Uh, and then we took a nice vacation over the holidays and boat trip or whatever. We come back in January and I'm like, it's like a new year. I'm looking forward, right? Instead of looking backwards, like, hey, it was just a month ago. I left Oracle. It was like, I've got all of, what was it, 20, 
2011 in front of me, you know, like, okay, you know, maybe I'd like to meet the founders. So in February or January, I flew down to uh, Orange County where the uh, same group was founded in Riverside, California, okay. uh, and met the founders. And I'm like, oh, these seem like good guys. And uh, I followed up with Isaac, who's the primary founder and the person really responsible for 99% of all of Sanguine's success. Uh, and then Isaac didn't follow up with me. And I'm like, eh, oh, well, you know, I guess we're going a different direction. And uh, <laughs> I, don't know I kept running, I guess. And uh, it turns out Isaac, uh, ironically, is not very good at email. Uh, just following up on email. He just kind of, you know, it doesn't follow up like business people do, right? You have a certain cadence to things. He just gets his head into other stuff and then, you know, time goes by and people think yeah, right. he, he's forgotten about you. He's like, no, you, anyway, so he wrote back and made a you know, very nice offer and I shook his hand and said, awesome, let's get to work. Great. And, uh, yeah. Was your, wife, was, your, was your wife hoping you were going to take some time off or was she like, yeah, please go back to work? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I think she was, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle. Uh, <laughs> But kids, was, were your kids were your kids grown? No, they were grade school, grade school age. So that's uh, that's what's okay. fun. Is that, um, okay. you know, people beat around them. I think even if I wasn't working, like Frank at Oracle didn't take that much of my time. At the, by the time I'd gotten that far, I travel a lot. The nice thing about Oracle is you fly, you know, first class and stay in great places, and your audiences are are amazing. You really you talk to legitimate, you know, large company CFOs about. You know, how they run their finance and accounting functions uh, versus being in a small company out know, of Colorado. Maybe you're talking to a director of finance at some division somewhere about, you know, how they ought to think about, you know, capital planning or whatever the issue is. And so that was a lot of fun. Uh, but I did that last year at Oracle is the only year I really took off from training. So there was like no triathlons, no running. Uh, I, had to, I wore suits every day. I had to buy bigger suits. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. you, so, so you eventually, you took Syngrid, Syngrid to uh, a successful acquisition, right? No, uh, I took it a long ways. Uh, I was doing about a million a year uh, of run rate revenue when I got there. I was employee 25 to 250 employees. And nice. Two million in run rate revenue. Nice. Uh, but the, the board decided it was time to pass the baton to someone else to take it to if I was the series C to A B person, the C you know D you know IPO person, okay, uh, went through a uh, you know full interview uh, process, recruiters, etc., uh, and brought in Samir. Uh, Samir uh, came in in 2014, uh, and then took the company from there uh, to the IPO and eventually the acquisition by Twilio. Did uh, you so did, really, did you so stay on? Really, did go ahead? No, no. So uh, <laughs> I am very. Um, sort of happy with how I built the business and all the people. Okay. Think of it as like a house. You know, if you build a house and put your own furniture in it and you arrange it a certain way, uh, and then you sell that house to someone else and they want to change the paint and move the furniture around, you're like, well, wait, you know, I don't want to do yeah. that. So, yeah. <laughs> so whatever his first day is, my last day will be the day before he starts, right? It's like okay. give him a clean slate to gotcha. do it your way, right? But you don't want to have two people. So my, actually my dad, when he was the CEO of a hospital, you know, they got acquired. And they had this sort of co-CEO arrangement for a year. And that was, that was not fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It never works out. Not, yeah, I don't recommend it either. Yeah, it never works out. Did you walk away with a bunch of equity and you were thinking, okay, if this guy, if this guy can, you know, take it to 200, 400, 500 million dollar company, that's great for me because I, I got a piece of the action. Yeah, they're becoming worth billions. Uh, yes. And so I was fully vested uh, on that initial, you know, CEO grant. Um, and so, and there was some acceleration there. I think the you know, foundry and the board people were, you know, very uh, friendly. It really wasn't about economics. They were very happy with what's called the first billion of value, right? Just we were on a trajectory to Great. get that first billion. But the, 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 the odd thing is in certain communities, you know, getting a billion uh, you know, isn't always the goal. It's more than that, right? Is that uh, we uh, actually brought in Byron Dieter with Bessemer. And, you know, Byron's companies, you know, more in the, you know, two, three, four billion category. And where you know, I struggled was like, where does that second billion come from? Mm -hmm. And we tried a variety of things. The, the, the product market fit was awesome, but it was, it was like a rifle shot at sort of a billion dollar valuation. And so the, mm -hmm. even the, you know, multiples, et cetera, had to kind of stay on track. Uh, but it was like, what is that second act? And that was a very hard question. And I think Samir tried some things too, but it's like, at the end of the day, you know, going public on some very predictable numbers, you know, that was a good thing. But again, right at that billion valuation, uh, and then having uh, Twilio, who's our partner from day one, we were like sister companies. They were 
funded a year before us and they really innovated the developer relations model. And then we were just kind of drafting with them on that developer relations model. So I've spent a fair amount of time with Jeff in Paris and India and other places as we would run a lot of these programs. Uh, well, in India, we had Microsoft posted it and it was LinkedIn launching some API they wanted developers to use. But no developers will show up to a Microsoft LinkedIn event, right? You honor. But when you have Twilio and Sandwich showing up and hosting it and emceeing the event, then developers are, you know, come out of the woodwork. They're like, this is awesome because we had strong credibility with uh, sort of born in the cloud, you know, 28 year old developers was our thing. We had 200,000 developers uh, even at the sort of end of, of my watch. And so that, that community was just an incredibly powerful uh, asset. So in a lot of ways, we'd been very close um, with Twilio from, from day one. And so, so you exit there in 2014 and you're thinking, now you're thinking you're going to retire, but then you start getting tapped on the shoulder to be board member here and there, right? You start getting those phone calls. <laughs> well, I've always been on uh, some boards. I would recommend to people, even if you're early career CEO founder type is be on at least one other board, but not more than one. It's good. Uh, and if you have a, you know, and you should as a CEO community of other CEOs you hang out with, right? And get on each other's boards, right? Because you each learn a lot by working on someone else's business. It's like a lens back on your own business if you want a sort of business reason to do it. But you'll find it just a lot of fun. At least I do. It's a lot more fun working on someone else's business than working <laughs> on your own. And uh, it helps draw that distinction of being in the business versus working on the business, uh, working in versus working on. Uh, and yeah, those are good concepts from Bad about mid distance, about how to be a good board member. You don't want to be too close, you don't want to be too far away. And it just really helps you understand that board role that you're dealing with as a CEO uh, and you know, by seeing it from the other side. So I've always been part of uh, different boards, but certainly, again, another Brad story is uh, at the end of Sengrid, he said to me, he's like, hey, you know, we're going to go a different direction. We're hiring Smear. And you know, he said, you could be on 13 boards and still feel retired and unemployed. I'm like, okay. And so I got on eight boards there in probably the fall of 14 or 2015. And uh, let's just say I felt like I was an oracle without the paycheck because I felt like I was busy and I'm like, uh, you know, and uh, one company had a CEO search come up uh, pretty quickly and uh, I knew the venture people on the board. They said, hey, Jim, why don't you do it? And I'm like, because I'm done being an operator, right? It's like, been there, right? And, but, uh, but I have some strong opinions about how to do CEO search as well and how to use recruiters and uh come up to your criteria and do a whole process uh, around CEO recruitment and onboarding. How about, how about three tips on first time board member, anybody that's listening, they, it's their first, you know, board assignment. What would you tell them? Wow. Okay. Uh, so tip one is mid distance, find that right cadence uh, with that CEO uh, and that team. If you're too far away, you can't be helpful. If you're too close, you're caught in the daily drama. And sometimes you'll be too close and times times you'll be too far away and you'll have to kind of find, uh, that cadence or that closeness. Uh, maybe the second one will be uh, around cadence with the CEOs. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably half the boards, I just do ad hoc. You know, call me when you need me. Uh, you want, as a board member, you want to be helpful, but not intrusive. Mm. Uh, as a CEO, uh, you know, I don't like really intrusive board members. I'll put it that way. I like running the business. And uh, when I joined the same grade board, I told uh, those board members, I met them in the fall before I joined. I said, if I build or buy any battleships, I'll let you know. Right. And, <laughs> By using some humor, but just says like, you know, the, the issue around and have clarity around who makes which decisions. Uh, and so that's sort of a, a, you know, a big thing. And when, when I think I'm hiring executives, we're going to go do stuff. It's like, I see a lot of power sort of the management team and the board has a, you know, so obviously some key responsibilities like hiring and firing the CEO and, you know, mergers and acquisitions and IPO and, you know, financing. But that's kind of it. I take kind of a, a narrow view. Uh, and then probably the other issue with the, uh, the other third sort of tip for a board member, if you will, is it's, it, you will make an impact at most once a year. So especially new board members, they show up and you see them like, oh, I need to make an impact. I need to justify while I'm here, right? I think that's very bad behavior. It's okay to just shut up and listen for, you know, let a few meetings go by, watch a few quarterly cycles go by, right? You know, what do they say? You just be quiet and everything's your wise and open your mouth and everyone realizes, you know, oh, maybe you don't know so much about that topic. Uh, I think that's, that's good advice because a CEO, uh, if you're an early CEO, uh, you earn your pay one day a quarter. And when someone told me that, I said, bullshit, do you know what I do every day? It's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, and but then when that day came around, I'm like, 
Oh, that's what they're talking about. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The management meetings and the all hands meetings and the firefighting between sales and engineering and all that stuff. That's just stuff. But one day a quarter, you'd be like, oh yeah, you know, you need to exit a founder or fire a VP or tell a customer you're not going to deliver what you promised to deliver or tell an investor your results are less than spectacular and they've got to take it to their, <laughs> to their partner meeting and get a bridge loan to help you get to, you know, just those are the days, right? Where you, as a CEO, you earn it. So as a board member, you know, once a year, uh, and if I can give a fourth tip, okay. it should be what all the doctors sign up to, right? The Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And as Good. board members, I'll say we are generally, we've had some success somewhere. And so we have a lot of confidence oftentimes in how we say things. And we don't have a lot of knowledge about the particular business we're looking at. Uh, and I joined boards of companies. I know like nothing about the underlying industry. And just like when I've been CEO, I don't really know anything about you know, email infrastructure at SendGrid, or I'm not really a math person at Crystal Ball. I wasn't a security person at Verisap. I don't know anything about baby photos at my other company that I started. It's all about the process. Mm -hmm. um, and I lost my chain of thought. <laughs> oh, uh, the, you know, the first, first tip, tip, fourth, fourth yeah. tip on the board. Yep. Yeah, for this, do no harm because you'll have high confidence in your opinions, but you'll have low knowledge. And in the confidence yeah. knowledge, you know, quadrants, you're in the high confidence, low knowledge is very, very risky. And if you're the CEO, use that framework to analyze your board members and say, is this person speaking from a position of high confidence, but low knowledge? Mm -hmm. If so, you need to discount what they're saying. Mm -hmm. If they're high confidence, high knowledge, like a surgeon, right? They're confident and they're in their area of expertise. Awesome. Uh, and then you can look at the other parts of that quadrant, but the, the one to really watch out for and the one that board members and CEOs tend to step in all the time uh, is high confidence, low knowledge. Because That's we're extrapolating stuff. our playbooks from you know, what worked in a different situation. So a great interview question for CEOs or board members is how are you going to adapt your playbook for the facts on the ground here? So That's good stuff. That's good stuff, Jim. Speaking of, CEO, speaking of CEOs, let me ask you a couple of tips there. Um, what would you say to somebody, two or three quick tips on how to get there? In other words, they're, they're a director or they're a VP and they really want to be a CEO so, someday. So a couple of tips on how to get there. And then two or three tips on first 90 days as a CEO, first time CEO. Two part question there. How to get there and then, and then first 90 days. Go for it. All right. I'd say the first tip is to have a clear personal mission statement. Have a goal. You can say, so my goal was to be the CEO of a venture back company in Boulder, Colorado. The, seriously. And, now, now, seriously, I want to pause you right there. You actually, that was a goal you had written down. That, that was a specific goal. Well, if I didn't write it down, I said it a lot to myself. <laughs> okay. I'm driving out to Colorado in my FJ40 <laughs> with no radio. I actually had eight radio. So I can listen. This is before talk radio. It was just you know, oldies, cool. country, and baseball. Right. Right? And right. so, cool. cool. But it was, I want to be the CEO of a venture back company in Boulder, Colorado. And so... Cool. I'm living in Williamsburg and I've got an education and no work history other than teaching tennis, more or less. And so it's like, how am I going to do this? I'm going to move to Colorado. Step one, move, you know, move to Boulder, right? Step two, find some kind of housing you can afford, right? That's, right? But step three, get involved in venture, right? So there's, there's some ways, but have, so the first step is to have a okay. personal mission statement. Uh, the second more tactical advice might be, be dangerous in two of the three disciplines. So the three disciplines are product, you know, sales, go to marketing stuff, and finance operations. And so as an accounting CFO type, I started off on the finance operations leg of the stool. That was my first big break, uh, was to be the CFO at a four-person company. That's the one we grew up to be part of Oracle. Uh, but I went from CFO, and actually, so, and then being public about your goal. So I would tell people, I want to be the CEO of a venture back company in Boulder, Colorado. And so the CEO of the company I was at knew that. Right. I would talk about it, you know, when you have beer and stuff, you want to yes. be a CEO someday. I'm gonna, yeah. And then, and so he knew that and, and he knew this, you know, you want to be dangerous in two of the three disciplines. I'm not really a product guy. And so uh, I'm more of a you know, sales and marketing person because I think a good CFO knows how to sell stock. That's raising money. And so in our little business, I had uh, done everything other than build the product and sell it. I hired everybody. And unfortunately, our VP of sales had a, got an infection in his brain and became like clinically paranoid and was committed to a hospital uh, against his will by oh. a spin ring. And so we wow. had this crisis in our sales team where our wow. leader just got taken out. 
we had sales reps, but we had no leader. And so the CEO said, you want a shot at VP of sales? I'm like, hell yeah. And I'd never had a quota in my life. <laughs> and now I'm running a sales team. And I completely stepped away from finance. We backfilled my role. And if I was not successful as VP of sales, there was no going back, right? You're out of the company. Uh, and so I had to, you know, I own the number. Uh, and I learned a couple of things. Uh, one is the VP of sales makes a hell of a lot more money than the CFO. And more, <laughs> <a lot> less. <laughs> it's about a four to one ratio, right? I worked half as much and made twice as much money, right? So it's like four times better off. And that's why I'm starting a company with my free time and extra money. So, but second tip, right? Be dangerous in those two out of three. And the third tip for how to become a CEO is hang around people who hire CEOs. Right. All right. So how do you do that? <laughs> who hires CEOs? Boards of directors. VCs on those boards, right? They're the ones who are, especially uh, here it is in October of 2020. And this is the season where boards and venture capitalists are thinking, how's our year going? Are we going to make our year or miss our year? We're going to miss how much? Probably by, you know, a third, like a lot of companies do. Okay, we've got some plans for 2021. Is this the right team to go do those plans? Are we going to make a change in the team and have a new team for 2021 and beyond? And so, you know, being plugged into that network and how do you do that? Anyone can do it. And all you need to do is some fundamental things. You need to show up and be helpful. And so when I was 26 and I had an education, uh, you know, the people at uh, Rockies Venture Club uh, found me and said, you know, come here, right? And I, and I had time. And so I could be on the membership committee. I would call all the first time attendees. If you didn't renew, I would call you. I was on the sponsorship committee. So I'd call all the lawyers and accountants and say, let's go to lunch at some fancy Denver restaurant and say, are you going to re-up? And they'd say, well, tell me about your programs. I'm like, this is what we're doing. We put butts in seats. So like, sure, they'll write that check for 2,500 bucks or five grand if you deliver good programs. So I was on the programs committee. What would I do in programs committee? I would call all the VCs and say, hey, I'm Jim with Rockies. Would you come speak on our panel about how to raise money in, the, in these times? And I swear it was just like uh, running a running magazine. Uh, is being a lifelong runner, you get runner's world every year. It's the same content, you know, how to run your fastest 5k, do your first marathon, recover from injuries, right? Like how to lose weight over the holidays. <laughs> it's just a shoe review, right? <laughs> and so being part of Rockies for 20 years, right? It's just like, you know, what's the role of bankers? You know, what's the role of vendors? You know, how do you do, deal with co-founder conflict? Just all this stuff. And so we would have, I could call every financing person in town, every investor and say, would you help? And to a person over that whole time, they always said yes. Yep. If you, you get want to help, help I, them, I agree. They, and if they can't make the date, they would help you find somebody. Well, I can't make it, but my partner can. I can, but, and so I got to be known by these people. I would go to Venture Capital Rockies. I probably went for 19 straight years. And I would pay the thousand bucks out of pocket for that ticket, which was expensive uh, to go to Beaver Creek or it used to be in Denver. And you just hang out. And that was like a gathering of the faithful. And sometimes I was a CEO of a company and I was pitching something. But other mm -hmm. times I would just show up and hear the other pitches and yep. go to the happy hours that Cooley and SVB and Square One and all those people would sponsor because they just recognized you as part of the ecosystem. And right. so, when, you know, years later, right, Brad Fell's thinking, geez, Segment needs a CEO. But that guy, Frank, was not doing anything. That's, that's how it happens. <laughs> Let's get it back to it. <clears throat> I mean, I just want to pause right there for the listeners. That is so critical. I mean, that's exactly how it happens. If you show up, if you're helpful, if you network, if you hang around the right people at the right time, and you tell people what you want, magical things can happen. And, and, you know, that's what you just described. And that's exactly what happened. Brad thought of you because you were there. You had been having conversations. He knew you were available. Yeah, you know, so often as a recruiting firm, we will get, you know, executives call us and say, you know, please help me. I'm looking for a job. And so I checked their LinkedIn. They got like 150 connections and they haven't been active for two years. They haven't gone to any meetings. They haven't gone to any coffees. They haven't networked at all. And they're calling me saying, oh, my gosh, I can't find anything. And my first point is, well, OK, let's start with how you're handling your networking. <laughs> I actually come up with a, a job search process. So uh, you've told the nice version of my career, right? There's always the backstory, right? And so for you listeners, right, every time you see some press release or whatever, like just believe me, there's always a backstory. And yes. so uh, I got fired as that VP of sales uh, once I made the transition uh, because I was actually offered the CEO job, but I didn't commit to stay for a year because I wanted to start my own company. And I'd started a startup 
on the side. Uh -oh, and I wanted uh -oh. to be a, I'd rather be a venture back founder than a CEO uh, yeah. at that point. I've been at the company for four or five years. I wanted, you know, I want to do something different. And so I ended up becoming a founder. All right. So I raised 5 million bucks. I'm, awesome. a, I'm, a, I'm a backed founder by SQL Ventures, which was the big fund in town before you know, Foundry was. And SQL was like my dream firm to be part of. And that was awesome. Except a year later, we were out of money, couldn't raise a B and, you know, parked it at zero. And so we you know, lost all of their money, $5.25 million. And I felt very bad about that. And I was ready to, you know, this was down in Lodo and I was ready to just come back to Boulder and go find a job as a CFO and pay my bills. And the guys at SQL said, well, we just gave two and a half million bucks to a security startup down in the tech center. Why don't you go down there and do your thing down there? And I said, well, I need a job. So, okay. Uh, what's my thing? <laughs> it's in the people stuff. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, I went down there and I was the CFO at a security startup that didn't have a CEO and that was an issue, but we ended up raising, raising more money. We raised uh, $5 million from Sigma Partners out of Boston on September 10th of 01, the day before 9-11. And the wow. business had two weeks of cash left. We were, I was gonna park it on September 30th, just like I did my own startup and go back to Boulder and be like, all right, I spent the summer here helping you people trying to raise money. And if it didn't work, it didn't work. But Oh my God, it worked. And we got the money in right before the world stopped um, and ended up staying there two years before I got fired again. Uh, because part of bringing in the money was we had to hire a CEO. And so we did a search and hired a recruiter and we brought in a CEO, Terry LaRue. And Terry's a good guy. He's made money for people, but he had his own CFO that he'd worked with for 10 years. Ah, his own yeah. guy. It happens. And so two years, he comes to me and says, you know, you're kind of done. I'm bringing in Connell, you know, see you later. Bye. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. So, it happens. Yeah, so I'm so looking for a job that summer. And I'm like, well, how do I find a job where I don't keep getting fired? And so uh, that's where the 4-H value system came from, which is something, uh, it's probably my most pr uh, proud professional achievement, is honest, hungry, humble, happy. So that summer, I was thinking about, like, where did Terry and I have conflict, right? It's like, Terry liked to play things close to the vest. He saw himself as like an orchestra conductor. As long as each department played their part, then there would be beautiful music. Uh, I had a completely different approach. I played things wide open. I would tell people what our burn rate was, how much cash we had, and uh, those sorts. I would tell the board it was happening real time. I was on the SQL Ventures Triathlon team. So I was very close with SQL, and SQL was the investors. And so, you know, I was the CFO, but then there was Terry. And so, you know, they had back to me. And so I was very close to them. And so I would just tell them in real time what was happening. And Terry, that was not his communication style. <laughs> I would say like a savvy CEO, he, he knew how to manage the information flow to a board, mm -hmm. uh, which you got to be careful of. So now when I'm a board member, I require direct access, not only to the CFO, but to any VP. Good point. So a tip for a board member, right, is you should require direct access to mm -hmm. management members mm -hmm. and use it. You meet with them one-on-one -on -one separately from the CEO. Uh, not that CEO are bad, but just you get a just like when you're a CEO, you should have skip level meetings. So mm -hmm. part of my process would be on Thursdays, I would go to the Cheesecake Factory with employees, you know, people who actually do frontline work. Oh, good. Uh, someone who builds something, someone who sells something, and someone who does a support function. And you learn so much <laughs> in those lunches about right what's tip. happening, you know, because your management team are you know all good hearted people trying to do the right thing, but it's just human tendency you have to filter. That's right. And information keeps getting you know, rosier as it goes up the chain. So <laughs> That's right. You know, you're like, man, this is a great business. Uh, <laughs> so it does. It goes through all those filters before it gets to the CEO desk. Yeah. How about a couple of other tips for a first time? That's a good one, by the way. How about a couple of others? First time CEO or maybe first 90 days or six months. Anything you want to share with yeah. them? Yeah. First time CEO, there is, uh, there is so much. I um, know. We, we, could do, we could do a two hour podcast on just that topic. <laughs> Here's the big thing is don't parachute in. So your job as the CEO is to create a team mm. and get results to others. So they should do it. So if, if sales is failing, don't go in and close that big deal. Because what you're doing is you're putting a, a bandaid on it. You're not letting the organization feel the pain of not having the right sales leader. If your product's slipping and you're an engineering person, if you go in and fix the product, that's bad, right? Because you, your job is not to go fix the product and meet that deadline. That's the VP engineering's job or, the, the product people's job. It's like your job is to make sure the right leadership team. And so right. if you don't have that team, then that's sort of on you. I was part of a lot of CEO uh, groups uh, as having lots of venture capital. So every time you raise venture capital, you get plugged into a CEO group of all the 
CEOs back by that. And so uh, one of these CEO groups, one guy bragged, like, my engineering team wasn't getting it done. I stayed all weekend. I got all done. I, he basically said, I showed them motherfuckers how to do it. Like, <laughs> Like, I'm a great CEO, and I'm just you know, thinking, what a bonehead, right? It's like, you're just telling me you're, you're like the worst CEO, right? Because <laughs> you can't hire a good engineering team who delivers on their commitments, and you have to go in and be the hero, right? So watch out for that, that hero. So you know, don't parachute in. Probably the other thing is that as the CEO, as you go up the organization, your voice gets longer and louder, and every time you speak, it's policy, so you should be looking the farthest out, you know, one to three, five years out. If you're a VP, like a CFO or something, you probably think about the quarter, you know, VP of sales, you know, the quarter, maybe the month, did you go down? If you're a rep, right, you're thinking about, I need to do my daily call volume, right? I need to hit my you know, weekly right. number or something like that. And so your, yeah. your time horizon goes up, your voice is louder, and you set policy when you speak. Uh, so at Segrid, we had a business office in Boulder, basically, and we had a, an engineering office in California. And so I'm a business person. So I would fly to California, I'd hang out with the engineering people. And I don't know anything about engineering. And so they'd ask me some questions. I'd say some stuff, not realizing I was impacting what they were going to do. And so I'd right. come back to Boulder and then word would get back to me like, Jim, you know, when you go to California, all you can talk about are weather and sports, right? You cannot <laughs> talk about, <laughs> you know, because they, they think you're, you're changing the direction. And of course we have a product marketing team, product management team, and they're doing backlog grooming sessions and they're setting priorities. And you're going to just create a lot of chaos because you are shifting things. And if you're a founder, same thing, Isaac, you know, it's like he was not in sort of production engineering. He was like an R and D. So he could be in a low structure environment, which is where he was successful but a high structure environment where you're accountable for budgets and deadlines and all that stuff, like that is not his world. That's where you need to have that production engineering team. As a CEO, you can't be uh, saying things and, and disrupting people. Uh, I'm going to close with a, a story of CEO tip is, you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't and just get used to it, right? If it's if it goes wrong, <laughs> it's on you. If it goes well, it's on them. And well, I used to like to go to marketing meetings, uh, and we talk about price. And this was at my, the math software company. Because every company struggles with price. It's just a hard issue, right? And if you're not struggling, you should think about it more. I mean, it's just a tough thing. Is you know, what is your pricing metric? What should you charge for, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And so I would go to a marketing meeting. We talk about price. And I would say something like, well, maybe this or maybe that. And what would happen, right? People would pick up their pens, write it down, and stop talking. And I'd be like, no, 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 I just want to participate as an equal as we're trying to wrestle with this tough question of like, how should we structure pricing? But as a CEO, when you say stuff, it just, even with your best intentions and all the warnings, it just stops the conversation. So I couldn't I agree more. Marketing meetings and then people are like, oh, Jim doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're so right. I mean, kind of a kind of a summary of what you're saying, I think is, correct me if I'm wrong, I say it this way, you know, when I'm giving CEO advice, I ran a couple of $40 million companies as a CEO, not, not quite as big as your stuff, but my biggest advice is, listen, as a first time CEO, learn how to listen more and talk a little bit less and ask a lot of questions, ask a lot of questions, listen more because you're right. Every single word that comes out of your mouth can spin somebody in a direction. And if you didn't follow the chain of command or you can make it messy, that's what CEOs don't realize. First time CEOs don't understand that as they maneuver through the office and have conversations, they're really creating these little mini storms. <laughs> they're like a boat going through creating a wake. Yeah. Uh, so, so true. Some other, some other quick tips along on the top of my fingers is have an office of CEO. It's not written down anywhere. Uh, but if you get a decent sized company, you'll end up having maybe seven or eight direct reports and founders and functional leads. Mm. But they're, you know, sort of designate two people who are, you know, first among equals. Uh, for me, I had a general counsel and sort of like a VP finance operations person. Mm. And the three of us kind of worked like a triumvirate, like in Roman times, right? You have uh -huh. sort of three people. And I found that that was a good sounding board. So when you're thinking about your annual planning or should we sell the company or should we raise money from Byron or whatever, it's like, they're the first two people you go to and say, what do you think? Am I crazy? What are the trade-offs? And then, then you take it to the bottom management team and then to the board, you know, et cetera. So having that office of CEO is important. I think also over communicating. You should feel like a politician. You should have a few key points about what you're doing. At SendGrid, we had the blue t-shirts with the white lettering, S-E-N-D, grid. Well, the send was actually part of our uh, strategy, which is scaling everywhere with innovation and double digit growth, S-E-N-D. And so every employee knew that we're all about scaling, everywhere geographically with innovation and double digit monthly growth. And so 
that was a mantra we would just sort of beat into people's heads uh, as long as the four H's, the honest, hungry, humble, happy. And so you should over communicate so much because I totally agree. People yes. struggle with that. I love it when uh, uh, marketing is trying to communicate to sales. There's some, some point about, you know, competitive battle card or something. And some sales reps like, oh, shit, I don't know how to handle this objection. Marketing's like, I've told you that six times. I said, well, so marketing. Here's the key to this, communicating with sales. Have you done it three times with food? <laughs> no, My it's, like, you know, it's like, well, you send an email to a sales rep, like, no, yeah, yeah, you know, no way. But you give them food, they're like, what? And you do it three times, they're like, oh, you, you must finally be serious, right? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll listen now. Totally agree. My line for that is repetition breeds knowledge. Repetition ah. breeds knowledge. You know, I, I could not agree more. I, isn't that so annoying when you have a direct report and they say, well, I sent an email a couple of days ago and I haven't heard anything. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> how, about, how about this? I know we're, man, I, I should have booked you for two hours, Jim. I know we're already getting close to our hour. Can I, can I switch gears and just ask you for a couple of tips for people on raising cash? And again, I know we could do a full hour on that topic, but a lot of people listening to this podcast are early entrepreneurs and they're struggling with that early, you know, the first six months, first year, holy shit, they don't have any cash. They bootstrapped it. Just maybe a couple of tips on maybe when to raise and how to raise quickly, if you don't mind. Yeah, so there's a, uh, so like no judging, right? If you want to bootstrap a company and be profitable, awesome. We, I think we underappreciate those sorts of companies and there's a whole topic around that. Uh, there's sort of angel capital versus uh, local capital versus let's call it coastal capital. So the three different buckets and sort of understand the different rules of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have time to go on those, those rules, but like angel capital I'd say is pretty dangerous because it's sort of small dollars and high hassle. It just, it just is high. It's family. It's people that, you know, are going to bug you. So I would try to stay away from that. But like local VCs, I think kind of a sweet spot. Okay. Uh, and coastal VCs will probably want to have a local lead anyway. So before you go to a coastal VC, like start with the local community. And the local community is actually quite easy to engage with uh, through the other founders, through lawyers and accountants, through all the associations. It's not that hard to read. They, they're on Twitter, right? Natty with Matchstick is like, I'm looking for deals. Just hit me up, right? It's like, you can talk to these people. And the way to talk to a local venture capitalist is early and often. Mm. So you can say, hey, Natty, you know, I, let's get on a Zoom call, whatever. I want to, I want to, I just want to chat with you about what I'm doing in the conversation. No PowerPoints, you don't need all that stuff. You just say, Hey, Natty, I'm going after this market this way with these people. You know, what do you think? I'm concerned about this thing over here. Uh, what do you think? And he'll say, Well, I think that's a good market. That's a clever way to do it. Uh, those people, oh, maybe this is okay. Maybe it's not. That thing you're worried about, I wouldn't worry about that. But I've seen three other companies with the same maybe business model or comparable market, and they had issues over here, here, and here. Maybe you should think about those things. And you say, oh, great. I hadn't thought about those things. Let me think on that some more. Hang up, go away, right? Think on it some more, do some more stuff, pick them back and say, hey, daddy, that thing you told me, you made a difference, right? You made an impact. I've changed my thinking now, right? I'm not gonna worry about this. I'm gonna change the model this way. I dropped this co-founder, I picked up this co-founder, I got that partner. Like, you know, maybe they're not inked yet, but it's like, oh, well, they would, you know, if we build it, they would come. You're like, you know, what do you think is you know, right next time? So you see what we're doing here. We're just drafting them on the Building, team. yep. Yeah, yep. and so, yep. Yep. Yeah, building raise, a relationship. Yeah, raise, raise money locally. And so I can never really remember even asking a closing question because it was always, you're explaining your goal you're explaining what you're doing. And maybe it's like getting the CEO job, right? And it's like, and then they're smart enough to realize like, I want to be part of this. And I understand the capital requirements of what you're talking about and the timing. And so it's like, you're going to need money like in May, if you want to get that trade show demo done by June, right? And I was the investor on in that case. So it was like, yeah, so I need to give you money now so you can hire that person to get the demo so we can see if you know, we get some traction over the summer. And you know, that's basically the first bet. Uh, and so, uh, that's how it's the early and often approach versus the coastal approach is completely different is that that's the situation where you need to be buttoned up and you have yet one shot at a first impression right and so be having a tight deck knowing all of your objections you're going to get you know how you're going to handle them say yeah great glad you asked boom that actually is perfect uh and so that that's where i would start with the the local fundraising i really i really encourage people on that uh, early and and often with local i think that's that's great most of the time these early founders they don't even have the money to fly out to california and do any pitches right they're they're, they're just trying to, <laughs> they're trying to work their other job 
that's still paying the mortgage while they're doing the startup here in, in Boulder or Denver, barely getting by. Yeah, if you'll just build some relationships early and often, like you said, with some local uh, investors, you never know what can happen. And you're right. Once that relationship is there, they'll be the ones to offer cash before you even ask for it. So yeah, yeah great, great advice. Here's my last bit of the career slash fundraising advice uh, is eat lunch at the Cheesecake Factory. And what I mean by that is I have eaten well over a thousand lunches at the Cheesecake Factory, well over uh, 500 in just two years. And I've done it for 20 years. Uh, and what I do is a big table and I invite three people. And so when I was a CFO I like at 28 it. years old, I don't know what I'm doing. I would invite three other CFOs who are maybe 38 years old to come to lunch and they'll say yes and I'll buy. And then I get to ask the first question, like how do you put together a board packet? You know, just whatever it is. And then a conversation happens. I learn a ton of stuff. I pick up the check and we all go our separate ways, right? And so now I've made three friends. They're, you know, I've got 10,000 LinkedIn connections. I probably know 3,000 of them decently well, right? It's yeah. just people I've met along the way. They were helpful uh, and that's uh, awesome. When I became the VP of sales, same thing. I'm like, I don't know what you VP of sales. How do you deal with uh, you know, all the conflict that happens? It's like, oh, I would bring people together. We have a lunch, they go away. Same thing as CEO. First time being a CEO, have lunch with three people who are a CEO about five, 10 years ahead of you on your career tra trajectory. That's great. Same thing with the investors. You know, bring, the, you bring more than one investor together, bring them to lunch and say, you know what? I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? That's it. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if high school and college prepared young people for, for better networking? I mean, really, it's so critical. Well, I'm, I'm working on that, teaching a venture capital course at the CUMBA program. They're not all even on LinkedIn. You know, some of them didn't link in with me for six weeks into the course. I'm like, come on, people. Every come on. Week, every week, <laughs> on how did you become a VC? Every story is just the power of the network. It is. You know, it this, is. And do this, and again, because things go wrong, and then you recorrect, and then opportunities come up, and it's a very nonlinear process. Uh, to become a VC or a CEO or exited founder. Jim, I could, I could keep you on the podcast for another two hours. I should have booked you for like two hours, man. We, I mean, there's, I'm looking at my list of questions that I wanted to ask you and there's, there's like 10 other ones here, but listen, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, we should, you should definitely come on the show again. I would like to go deeper on, you know, the, the uh, things like picking co-founders uh, some of the early bootstrapping, how much risk you should take, you know, whether you know, when to go all in and quit your job. There's so many other things I wanted to go into, but. Let me give a plug then for that. It's the Founder Institute, uh, started by Dale Messi in the Bay Area. Uh, there's a class running in Denver, I think pretty soon. Uh, okay. I was the director of it for four years back in like 2010 to 2013. Uh, okay. And it's a 14-week program that hits exactly all those issues. It's Great. one night a week, so you keep your day job. It takes people who are ordinary citizens puts them through a 14 week intense experience and you come out with like a little gold star of being a founder, right? Uh -huh. It's a founder literacy curriculum. And so we would have three speakers a week come in and talk for half an hour on co-founder dynamics. And then I'd speak for two hours on co-founder dynamics. And then we'd go out and drink beer for two hours talking about co-founder dynamics. So it was about six hours of content on Tuesday nights from 6 p.m. to midnight about all those things, how to deal with vendors or naming and branding and corporation, just all this stuff about how do you sort of put it, put it together. There and are, there, 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 there are lots of avenues to, to learn stuff like that, right? There's so many different organizations and groups and podcasts and different things you can be part of. If you just do a little bit of homework. Yeah. Uh, and if I does charge entrepreneurs and I generally don't like charging entrepreneurs, but it's about a thousand bucks, I think. Okay. But it, it's just, it's sort of that skin in the game and you have to incorporate a business in Delaware while you in the program, right? So you will start a business and, and it's, it is brutal and it's designed to be brutal because uh, a day is trying to get you ready for the real world. And <laughs> right. You, you think class is brutal, then don't, don't be a founder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just about to say it. Yeah. The training better be brutal because starting a company is more brutal than we can possibly explain on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, I liked it. In Colorado, we're not brutal. We're nice people, right? We want to encourage people. But I think we were doing a disservice because we were encouraging people maybe to start things when they weren't ready to do, yeah. they weren't ready for the consequences. <laughs> right. Money or life consequences. Um, that's, that a, that's, a, that's, that's another two hours of uh, family yeah. dynamics, relationship stress, uh, all the rest of it. Uh, Jim, I really appreciate you being on the Rider Flex podcast and sharing and, and giving back. Thank you, sir. If you think today's tip or guest interview can help someone you know, please share this with them. 
If you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to our channel and hit the like button. If you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to hit that little bell next to the subscribe button so you can be notified when we release a new episode. Our show features entrepreneurs, business executives, and the stories behind how they got there, as well as daily tips on career advice and job interviews. You can visit riderflex.com to learn more about us and get information on the recruiting and consulting services we provide. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.